Thanks for visiting with us tonight. Uh, my name is Travis Forney. I'm an adult services librarian at the Willoughby Public Library. We're coming to you live from Lake County, Ohio and Chicago, Illinois. Uh, before we get started tonight, I want to tell you about a few upcoming programs we have in the Between the Lines series. <clears throat> coming up next week, we have Paula McLean, who will talk to us about her new novel, When the Stars Go Dark. Uh, and we have two upcoming events in our Lake County Reads program. Uh, three weeks from today, the editors and authors of the Rust Belt Publishing book, um, Black in the Middle, will talk to us. And a month from today, number one New York Times bestseller, Jess Walter, will talk with us. So please consider registering for those future events. Tonight, I'm extremely excited to welcome Ted McLellan back to Between the Lines and back to Willoughby Library. I had Ted in for a talk at Mentor Library years ago, and I think I've talked with him three times now at Willoughby Library. So he's becoming, uh, I don't know. Regular. The, yeah, the, a regular for sure. Uh, Ted has written many books about the Midwest, including Folk Tales in the Middle West, How to Speak Midwestern, the Third Coast, and his most recent book, Midnight in Vehicle City, about the start of the UAW in Flint, Michigan. Tonight, we'll be talking to Ted about what I think is his first novel, Running for Home, a coming-of-age story about a gifted high school runner set in a fictional Michigan town, just as a plant that's employed generations is closing. Now, if you have questions for Ted tonight, just type them in the chat or as a comment on Facebook, and I'll ask Ted your question. Ted? Thanks so much for visiting with us again. Thank you, thank you. So I guess I'll start uh, by reading reading from the book, reading from uh, an important chapter, the chapter when uh, um, our, our narrator, our protagonist, Kevin, finds out the plant where his father works uh, is gonna close down, something probably familiar to everybody in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, okay, Kevin, is a, he's a high school cross country star. And so he's running back to school after practice. Um, the run from school to our home course always took us past Empire Body, past the floral emblem, past the South Gate where the bodies were loaded onto trucks, across the railroad tracks and past Pete's Place. That's the shop bar. The day we found out the plant was closing, we were jogging back from a five by 1000 work out in the woods. It was late October, so we were wearing our sweats with the green emblem of Chief Wentaway in a feathered headdress. The smoke unfurling from the slim chimneys was outlined sharply against the chilly sky like pale pennants of steam. As our pack approached the plant, we saw workers milling on the sidewalk. My first thought was to cross the street to avoid having to run through the crowd, but then I saw my dad out there sucking hard on a cigarette. I never saw my dad hanging around outside the plant, and I hadn't seen him smoke since Graham was diagnosed with cancer. So I stopped running while the other guys went on ahead. What's going on? I asked my dad. He was coatless shivering in a flannel shirt. How come everyone's standing around? We're shutting down. What happened? I figured the plant must have been evacuated due to a fire or else the shift was sent home because the line broke down. A bunch of assholes in front and decided we're obsolete is what happened, a voice beside my dad spat. My dad raised his hand. Jim, my son is here. Then he turned back to me. We were called into a meeting today with the head of the Empire Body Division. He told us this plant and the plant down by the river are going to close next year. They don't think it's quote unquote efficient to build bodies in one place and truck them somewhere else for final assembly. So instead, they're going to build one big plant in Tennessee. My dad's angry coworker shouted, it's bullshit. Jim, Gary, how about getting angry for one hot red hot minute? You're making me angry, my dad retorted. Number one, you're cussing up a storm while my son's standing here. And number two, nothing you or I say is going to change what the company said today or what the company's going to do. Dad put his arm around me and guided me to the curb. Go finish your run and meet me at home, he said. I'm going to head over there right now so I can tell your mom before she sees it on the six o'clock news. There's a TV truck interviewing guys going in and out of Pete's. I hope they get him going in because as outspoken as they're going to be then, they're going to be a lot more outspoken coming out. We're done running, I told Dad. I just have to go inside and change. All right, I'll pick you up outside the locker room. We'll tell her together. By the time we got home, mom already knew. Everyone in Wenaway knew, it seemed. Mom had gotten a phone call from Gramps, who had gotten a phone call from a union buddy who still worked in the plant. Your father sounded really angry, mom told dad. He was calling Empire a bunch of backstabbers. It's the most I've heard him say since your mom died. 
I had to hang up the phone when he started swearing. Dad grimaced. He doesn't even work there anymore, Dad said. He still takes it personally. Once a wildcat striker, always a wildcat striker. Dad sat us all down on the rust red and beige tartan couch that had been the central feature of our living room for my entire life. My mother's afghan, hand knitted in a green and orange zigzag pattern, was draped over the back to be pulled down on sick days or TV watching nights when the close to zero cold seeped through the plastic sheeting insulating our windows. First of all, Dad told us, it doesn't look like I'm going to lose my job. The new plant in Tennessee isn't going to require as many workers. They're streamlining the process. It makes sense. But I've got 25 years seniority, so I can transfer down there if I want. The question is, do I want to? His mom listened. She needed the Afghan in her hands, gathering bundles of yarn. It'd only have to be for five, six years, and then I can retire on full benefits, Dad said to Mom. We wouldn't be as well off as if I'd stayed on for 40 like Dad, but I can't see moving the whole family down south. I'm not going to leave Dad up here all alone, and Deb's about to have a baby. You've got your job at the hospital, and Kevin's in school. We've been going to Friendship Methodist for 20 years now. You just can't interrupt a life in the middle and start it all over again. The other alternative is uh, I stay here and look for something else, but I don't know what else there's going to be for a guy my age, especially in a town that's losing two auto plants. I'm quitting Empire before I get my 30 and would be throwing away my lifetime health benefits. How are you going to work in Tennessee while we're up here, Mom asked. There'll be plenty of other guys going. We can room together, carpool up and down every week. Dad walked to the bookshelf beside the TV set and pulled out a road atlas. The atlas had been published in 1976, but its cover was still glossy, its pages crisp. The wards didn't travel to many places we didn't already know how to get to. My dad had never flown on a plane, and the only letters he ever wrote were to my Uncle Dick when Dick was in the Army. Dad didn't have to leave one away to see or speak to anyone he knew. He thought he was set for life at Empire. He hadn't counted on having to move to Tennessee. As Dad paged to the big map of the United States, I looked back and forth between my parents, sitting hip to hip on a couch whose springs had sagged to settle them close together. Since they were married, they had probably never spent a night apart. Anytime they'd gone out of town, mostly to Gramps Cottage up north, they'd gone together with Deb and me. Now they'd have to sleep apart five nights a week, 48 weeks a year. Dad pressed his little finger atop the name of the small town where Empire was building its new plant. Just south of Nashville, halfway from one way to the Gulf of Mexico. And Dad would have to make that drive twice a week. I've only been through Tennessee once, he said to Mom. That time we visited my brother when he was stationed at Fort Rucker before he shipped out to Germany. When Dad talked about that trip down south to Alabama, I realized something else. That and our one time hop across the border to Canada, just to say we'd been to a foreign country, but the only time dad had even left the state. His world, our whole family's world, was about to get a lot bigger, exploding across the map from this tight little kernel we'd always inhabited here and went away. When dad hired on an empire, he didn't sign up for a lifetime of travel. The shop was an antidote to adventure, a guarantee that in exchange for spending eight hours a day or more in that huge, smelly, windowless room, he'd have enough money to marry my mom and take care of Deb and me with a little leftover for summer vacations. That was all he'd ever wanted in 1958 when everyone in America had driven a big empire car. This was 1982, and even people in Wenaway were driving farty little Volkswagens and Japanese rice burgers, as my dad called them. Empire had to cut costs. I left my parents alone to plan this unexpected future, and I went up to my room to where I lay down on my bed and picked up a book called Great Runners of the 20th Century. It wasn't easy to get me to read. I'd rather be outside moving around like any athlete, but I'd read every book about running in the school library. And once I'd finished those, I'd gotten into the public library's collection. Lately, I'd been hero worshiping a guy named Jerry Lindgren, who had run back in the 60s in Washington State, but still held every high school record. Just a scrawny guy with big glasses from the photo with his bio, but he ran the 5,000 in 13 minutes and 44 seconds and the two mile in 840. He did it by training 200 miles a week. He ran 10 miles in the morning, 10 miles in the evening, and then he'd get up in the middle of the night and run another 10 miles. That made him so fast that when he was still in high school, he beat the Soviet Union's best runners in a 10,000 meter race. In high school, like me, who couldn't even beat Joaquin Torres or Steve Shaden or those two other guys from East went away. But I only ran 10 miles a day. If I ran 30 miles a day, could I break Jerry Lindgren's high school records, I wondered? And then I wondered what would drive a guy to run that much. After high school, he ran in the Olympics at 18. I would be 18 during the next Olympics in Los Angeles. 
And then he won 11 NCAA championships. Steve Prefontaine, the guy they just called Pre, was a running idol of the 60s and 70s because he was blonde and handsome and died in a car crash when he was 24. But he lost to Lindgren in the NCAA cross country championships. Lindgren wasn't the best athlete. He just ran the most. Maybe I couldn't run 20, 30 miles a day, but I could run more than anyone else in Wenaway, maybe in the state. Next morning at 6.30, I pulled on a pair of red nylon shorts and a t-shirt from the Pumpkin Fest 5K, the first time race I ever ran when I was 14. Out on the porch, the skin of my bare arms and legs clenched against the autumn chill. Every fall, I tried to run as far into the season as I could in a t-shirt and shorts, and every spring, I tried to barely get as soon as I could. My personal records, November 11th and March 4th. It was only cold for the first mile anyway. I was running five miles to the zoo and back, a distance I'd measured in my dad's car the day I got my learner's permit. My morning run was usually my time to think about nothing but running, but that was hard the morning I found out after I found out Empire Body was closing. My dad wasn't going to be home much for the next five years. I tried to push those thoughts away by imagining myself winning a gold medal in the 1500 meters at Los at the Los Angeles Olympics. In my head, I heard the voice of Howard Cosell, the loud, nasally sportscaster in the gold blazer. The first Olympics the United States has competed in in eight years since the Montreal Games of 1976. Now here is Team USA on home soil in Los Angeles, looking for gold in the golden state of California. Steve Scott considered the USA's greatest hope to defeat the British champions, Steve Ovett and Sebastian Coe, defending their medals from four years ago in Moscow. But miraculously, a young man named Kevin Ward, who graduated from high school just two months ago, has qualified for the finals. Echoes of Jim Ryan, another Midwestern schoolboy phantom, phenom, who broke the world record while still a teenager. They're lining up. There's the gun. Cohen Ovet take the lead. They pass the first lap in a swift 55 seconds. The first half mile in 151, a suicidal pace. Here's the bell, and look who's moving up from the back of the pack. It's young Kevin Ward of the US of A. At this point in Howard Cosell's commentary, I fixed my eyes on a mailbox I estimated to be 100 yards distant, surging toward it at what I imagined was a four minute pace. I was coursing not over a track under the floodlights of the LA Coliseum with 80,000 cheering me on, but over an uneven sidewalk cracked by frost, heaved by roots in the gray autumn dawn of Wenaway with nobody watching. But I had to run 100 yards as fast as Coe, Bet, and Scott before I could run a mile as fast as they did. The crisp brown leaves scattered across the sidewalk crumbled under my soles. I headed for the river. There was a hole in the fence separating Riverside Park from the Empire Motors Assembly plant rail yards. Ducking through it, I had the riverbank to myself. To my left, boxcars awaiting automobiles. To my right, the ever visible rainbow slick on the river's surface, the effluent of automaking. Past the dam with a stair step fish ladder where a lone angler in a quilted winter jacket dipped his line into the current. Then I was in the coal yards of the municipal power plant where grimy mud blackened the nubs of my waffle iron soles. I ran beneath the plant's 600 foot smokestacks, the tallest anything and went away. They're almost as long shadows spread out across the coal and the dirt and the water by the rising sun. Past the guardhouse where the coal trucks checked in. I wasn't supposed to run on the power plant's property, but the guards had seen me in my went away central sweatshirt. And now they just waved. I emerged onto a street busy with first shift auto workers trying to make it to the plant for clock in. Bar, bakery, windowless clubhouse of a motorcycle gang with a sign warning, if you don't know if you're welcome, you're not. Crossing the street, I ran across a vast weedy lot where a dozen years before a truck factory had burned down after sitting empty for a dozen years before that. I barely remember the midnight dawn of the fire, but my father still insisted it was ours. The insurance was worth way more than that polluted land. Why do you think that no one's ever built it on it? Then another mile on the planked river walk to the zoo. If I looked inside the gate, I could see a lion pacing behind the metal bars of his concrete cell. I didn't like looking at that line because everything with legs should have the freedom to run the way I was running. I touched the brick wall that surrounded the zoo, turned around, and ran the course in reverse. As I turned onto my block, I resumed the Olympic race in my head sprinting the last 200 yards to our house. And here comes Ward, Howard Cosell shouted. Cohen Ovet struggling toward the finish. They look utterly depleted. Can they hang on? They cannot. Ward is passing them in the home stretch, looking like a thoroughbred racing broken down milk horses. It's Ward, Kevin Ward, the first American to win this event since 1908. The gold medal that eluded Jim Ryan will hang around the neck of Kevin Ward. One of our neighbors hung an American flag from his porch. In my mind, it represented all the flags waving in the stands and the flag I would drape over my shoulders as I took a victory lap around the Coliseum. Every runner had that voice running through his head, whether he wanted to admit it or not. It may not have been Howard Cosell's voice, but it was a voice telling him he was a champion. Why run if you didn't have that goal?
All right, that's chapter three. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a good chapter to read. That gives a good uh, good taste of the book for right. sure. A, the, a little the, bit of the, a little bit of urban decline, a little right. bit of uh, the industrialization, a lot of running. I would exactly. Say. <laughs> that's that's what the book's all about. That, that's it. Um, yeah, but so before I before I ask Ted questions, I want to uh, tell everyone I put Ted's email in the chat. Ted McClellan to gmail.com. I'll put it as a comment on Facebook too. Uh, you can email Ted to buy a cop, buy a signed copy of Running from Home from him directly. Um, so Ted, Thank first you. question. Okay. Uh, why, why a book about running track? What's your, uh, do you have personal experience as a runner or? Yeah, uh, I, I, when I was in, I was in high school, I was like Kevin. Um, I wasn't big enough to play baseball or, or, or football or, or, or basketball. I think I was, I think I weighed 120 pounds when I got into high school. So it was pretty much running, running for me. That was the only sport at which I, you know, didn't embarrass myself. And I was never, I was never a champion. I never won a race, but uh, you know, that was the, that was the team I could be on. I could be on the cross country team. I could be on the, I could be on the track team. And uh, our, our high school was actually right across the street from uh, an auto plant, a Fisher body plant. Uh, and I remember, I remember, uh, inhaling uh this just the smell of paint when we ran on the track in the stadium right across uh from the plant and um i also remember you know when 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 uh we would have football games there'd be guys just standing in the balconies across the street watching watching the game you know having having a cigarette having a break up there so and, and you know we we our our school was surrounded by shop bars, you know, Harry, Harry's and Gus's and the shop stop uh, and union halls. And so, I mean, just the, the automaking was just uh, an inextricable part of life uh, in Lansing. And, you know, I, uh, I call it went away, but it's kind of a, um, an amalgam of Lansing and Flint in Michigan. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, where is Lansing in relation to Detroit? I, I don't well, this, we, we, this is what we always do. We always do that. It's right there. It's right in the middle of the state. That's why it's the capital. Oh, okay. It's centrally okay. located. It's about 90 miles northwest of Detroit. Yeah, okay. And yeah, the auto industry is just as strong there as Detroit kind of thing. Well, I suppose it was. I mean, Lansing was the home of the Oldsmobile, um, mm -hmm. which they don't make anymore. Although every year they have an event called the Oldsmobile Homecoming. And people bring all their classic cars there and show them off. What is the what is the classic Oldsmobile? Uh, maybe the Tornado. Oh um, yeah. Okay. I think Manix drove one of those. Uh, <laughs> uh, not really, not really the later ones. Not like the not like the Cutlass Sierra or any of those yeah. cookie cutter cars in the eighties. But you know, back in the sixties, you know, Oldsmobile was some, you know, serious American iron. You know, it was the the, the rocket <laughs> the rocket engine. Uh, you know, that song Rocket 88, which was supposed to be the first rock and roll song, that was about an Oldsmobile engine. And and there, were, there was a sign on the plant that said Oldsmobile, home of the rocket. Um, so can you talk about a little bit about how this book is connected to Midnight in Vehicle City? Yeah, um, I, I would call it a sequel to Midnight in Vehicle City because, it you know, it takes place a couple of generations after um, Midnight in Vehicle City. Uh, in the early 80s, which was when uh, the auto plants in Michigan really started shutting down. Um, uh, you know, I mean, Flint, Flint definitely had it worse than Lansing. Uh, I think Flint at one point in the in the 70s, they had something like 70 or 80,000 auto workers. And now they've got about 6,000 left. Uh, and, uh, you know, Kevin's grandfather, um, I, I don't know if I mentioned mentioned it in that chapter. He was, uh, in, I called it the Wildcat Strike, but the strike that founded the union, which I call the Auto Workers Alliance in the book. And so he's he's very he, he's from that militant generation. And when when Empire Motors, which obviously is based on General Motors, when they say they want to shut down the plant, he's out there, he's out there, you know, holding signs and and, and picketing, 
and uh, you know, getting getting all wound getting all wound up over this. And you know, his father is just uh, you know, he just wants to go along. He just wants to get his thirty years in. And there's there's a scene where there's a big argument between the uh, his father and his grandfather about how his dad isn't doing enough to protect his job, and he doesn't appreciate what the what the Wildcat strikers did for him, and so they don't they don't talk for a while. Uh, so that you know, there was that generational difference between the the generation that started the labor movement and the generation that I guess really benefited from it. Is the uh, so is the Wildcat strike in the book? Uh, is it? I mean, is that meant to be the sit down strike? Yeah, basically? you know, I, I even I even I even mentioned some incidents like the police shooting at the. Uh, that's that's the what stri- I strikers. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So so Gramps is basically a direct participant in the sit down strike. Exactly. Is, I wondered when I was reading that. I wondered um, why you felt or if when you were writing Midnight Vehicle City, you felt like uh, the sit-down strike needed a fictional treatment or something, or, um, you know, or, or if you felt like fiction handled, you know, handled that, that non-fiction part of this book differently or more effectively. Does that make sense? Yeah, I actually wrote this book before I wrote um, Midnight Vehicle City, but while I was thinking about writing a book about, about the Flint sit-down strike, um, and, you know, I kind of, I think maybe the, the, the thing that inspired me to write it is, is I kind of wanted to write about what I thought was the difference between, you know, what it's funny. I, I, I think I read somewhere that, that, you know, after Trump got elected, white working class fiction was going to be a hot topic. So <laughs> I said, okay, I'll write that. It, it almost was. <laughs> it almost but, was. Yeah. Uh, Certainly, certainly white working class nonfiction was for, yeah. for a hot minute there. Well, yeah, and now, now someone's trying to parlay <laughs> that into a Senate seat, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, he is. In Ohio, nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want well, to write my about, opinions on that. I don't know if we're friends on Goodreads, but look up my, uh, okay. look up my Goodreads review of that book. That's, uh, that's uh, I have, uh, I don't really tend to share my opinions here, so... <laughs> Well, I guess I wanted to write about what I thought was the difference between, you know, what the, the working class and the professional class. And to me, it wasn't, you know, a matter of talent or brains or it was just an orientation uh, towards, you know, family and community versus an orientation, you know, toward achievement and, you know, going away to make your way in the world. Because Kevin's got this uh, girlfriend, uh, Sarah, and, you know, her parents are kind of these, I don't know, uh, old folky um, school teachers and, uh, she's, you know, all she can think about is she's going to go, she's going to go to the big university, uh, at, after, after high school. And, you know, she convinces Kevin to, you know, try to win a scholarship there so that, that he can go along with her. And, you know, her, her father's just talking about how, yeah, there's not going to be anything. She doesn't have, she doesn't have roots in the community and her father's just talking about how there's not going to be anything left for them now that the plants are closing down and so she has to get out, but I think Kevin has a more, uh, a stronger, uh, more sentimental bond to the town than, than, than Sarah does. So, you know, the, the, you know, he's working to become a state champion. He's working to win a scholarship, but there's this question in his head over, you know, do I really want to, do I really want to, uh, go away? And, you know, I, it, it the, the time period, you know, happened to coincide with the release of a lot of really great 80s movies that I was able to have them go see. You know, they went to see Fast Times at Ridgemont High, they went to see The Outsiders, they went to see All the Right Moves, and they kind of got into an argument after they saw All the Right Moves, because, you know, it's all about, you know, Tom Cruise is going to play football, and he's going to he's going to get out of his dying steel town, unlike his loser buddy who gets his girlfriend pregnant and has to stay. You know, Kevin just kind of feels insulted insulted by that i guess it, it it hits close to home for him it uh went away reminds me a lot of, of ampipe which is the town in the movie why do you suppose kevin what what ties him to lansing just family or to went away um, all right sorry yeah. to win away sorry. yeah i'd say you know family and you know his family as i said there's you know they never really went anywhere else uh it's the only place he knows and you know his his 
family's struggling. His grandfather ends up having a stroke and you know, his father uh, uh, is, well, I, I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but uh, you know, he, he yeah, wants to no. stay in, he wants to stay in support. He, he, he thinks he, maybe he can stay and support his family and he feels like he can run anywhere. You know, he can become a runner from anywhere. You know, he, t- he talks about Bill Rogers, who was this kind of post-collegiate slacker. And all, then all of a sudden he started running around Boston. The next thing you know, he was a, he was a marathon champion. <laughs> um, so so yeah. he thinks he doesn't have to go away from one away to achieve his, his dreams. Yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, you you're of the you're of the same generation as as Kevin is. Yeah, he's a I think he's a year older and, than I am. And uh, you know, you're from Lansing, right? You presumably know a lot of people from there, um, right? Yeah. And you know, it's it's a real theme in in not only like fiction literature, but just in I don't know in society, people of you know, the migration away from cities like that. Right. Um, yeah. So I kind of wanted to turn that on its head. I, th- yeah, I think you did. I mean, even, uh, I guess it was even a theme back in the eighties. They were, uh, yeah. <laughs> they were all, uh, so it's interesting. Well, um, you know, I, I went away myself, but I actually just had an interview. Yeah, that's what I was, that, that's what I was getting at. You went to Chicago. I, right. I, I'm, I'm from Cleveland. I went to Chicago too. But I, think, but I actually just had a job interview back. with the with the Lansing State Journal. So. Oh, you knows? did. So you yeah. might be on your way back too. There exactly. Exactly. After <laughs> after 30 years away. <laughs> uh, all right. So I, I wanted to ask you a few questions about writing the working class. Okay. Um, how, how do you so how did you go about um, hitting down the voice of the working class characters in the book? Well, how, just how just by that? just by not thinking about them as working class. I mean, just by just by thinking about them as you know regular people who go to work and you know and go to school and go to church and you know join the join the join the track team. You know, I I, I didn't want to. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I didn't want to exoticize them, you know, or I, I didn't want to be on some, you know, working class safari like a like an East Coast reporter going yeah. to an Ohio diner or anything, anything like that. I mean, I, I just thought of people that I knew um, in Lansing, basically. Um, yeah. Did you see that? There's that there's it. an article, you know, the town I work in, Willoughby. They uh, yeah. Wall Street Wall Street Journal goes to the famous diner in downtown Willoughby during the oh, election. No. Oh yeah, exactly. It was, uh, yeah, it was yeah. A, you know, very, very. We're, we're we're very exotic here in Ohio. I don't right, know. right. So I, and <laughs> I I didn't get too political, except for the the time when uh, oh. Gramps and Dad argue about Reagan because Dad voted for Reagan and Gramps is you know diehard New Deal Democrat. So that was that was the only um, that was the only political note really in the entire book. So what what is it when when you were writing this? What did you think about in terms of what exactly the split is between Gramps and Gary's generation? Um, well, you know they they fought. You know they, you know they got shot at by the, the by the police, and you know they were they were militant. They 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 beaten the company, and then they were going to go on strike again, and they were going to beat the company uh, every time. And you know I think Gary thought that. Uh, Gary, who's Kevin's dad, thought that that he thought that that Milton's might have been one reason that that uh, the company wanted to leave, went away, and and move to Tennessee. You know, he thought that they yeah. they overdid it. And I think there there'll be people in Flint who will say the same thing: is that you know, the the, U, the union was too militant there, and that's why uh, GM left Flint. Do you think, um, do you think workers naturally, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious based on, you know, you wrote this book and the nonfiction yeah. version of it. Do you think workers um, want to believe that their employer has their best interest at heart? Um, um, and that's, and I mean, do you think that's the, do you think that in the span of one generation, I guess uh, it's Gary, a- you know, like he, he believes more in the employer than the that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, he got, you know, he he hired in there when he was 18 and 
you know, in a couple of years, he had enough money to, you know, get married and buy a house and raise his family. And so, you know, he, he, he didn't go through the, the, the years, you know, before the, the strike when, you know, working conditions were terrible. So he always had it pretty good at, at Empire Motors. He, they, they take, they taken pretty good care of him as far as he was concerned. Yeah. Um, did you know anyone who worked in the auto industry back in Lansing? Yeah, we had a close family friend um, who was actually a sit-down striker. He was one of the last surviving sit-down strikers. He died at the age of 98 in 2013. Um, and he's a guy named Everett Ketchum. He actually ended up marrying my stepmom's mother because uh, he was widowed twice. And you know, he would always be over for Sunday dinner and he was a member of our church. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, I knew people whose dads worked there, although I, I guess I didn't know it at the time. I, I didn't really know what anybody's dad did in, in school, but yeah, Everett, yeah. you know, he worked there for, oh, uh, 40 years, not, yeah, probably 40 years. And, you know, he, he did really well for himself. Uh, he, he kind of became this secret local celebrity they called him the dental man uh he used to he liked to flirt with waitresses at his pancake shop and he noticed that one of them kept covering up her mouth he said why are you covering up your mouth and she said well i've got really bad teeth and he's like how much is going to cost to fix them she said fourteen thousand dollars she's like i'll write you a check uh and then he did it for another one um you know he owned a bunch of rental houses in east lansing and he rented to students you know he probably had half a million doc dollars socked away there he was making $27 an hour as a tool and die maker in the seventies. So yeah. I think that was the best job in town because, you know, they ended up keeping their health care forever for, for life. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, uh, I don't know. The healthcare is a huge motivator for the working class today, for sure. Right. Right. Um, I mean, and, that, and that's, he's talking about, uh, that's the reason that he's, you know, going to talking about going to Tennessee for five years is, he gets in his, if he gets his, you know, they're saying 30 and out, uh, you can retire lifetime benefits after 30 years. So if he gets in his 30 years, then he can have health care for the rest of his life. So he's, he's trying to, to make it to that, to that benchmark, to that finish line. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you suppose things changed between Gary and Kevin's in the, in the view of, you know, and what's what's the generational change there in terms of well i don't how kevin they never, think about yeah you know. kevin never really counted on um working in the shop you know yeah. you know he's he, number one he was just kind of focused on running and you know well, he talk, he talks about having he talks about the idea of having that to fall back on though. yeah yeah but he doesn't seem too disappointed when it's not there anymore uh, I mean, he just kind of accepts that I'm not going to be able to do this. So now I got to, you know, focus, focus on my running and, and uh, you know, try to make, make something of myself this way. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, here's a, here's a question I wanted to ask, which doesn't really relate to the last question, but oh, well. Uh, so what's the value to you of chronicling the struggles of the working class? Um, let's see the value to me of chronicling the struggles of the, um, yeah. Why do, why do you think working class fiction or working class writing is valuable? Um, I guess it's, you know, to me, it's just like ordinary life. You know, I, I, I think in, you know, fiction and TV and movies, people just seem to lead these, uh, you know, lives where they live in these, you know, great apartments and, uh, they never, they never, uh, you know, have to worry about money. They never, they never have any bills. They never even seem to go to work. Um, and uh, it's, it's almost like that's, you know, that gets in the way of, of, you know, of, of whatever the plot is dealing with their interior lives or their emotional lives. And so I guess I wanted to write about people who uh, were, you know, who had, who had to worry about that. And, and I, you know, and I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, you know, write about that there's just as much talent in the, in the, in, in the working class and in, in any other, 
any other class, you know, he's this, he, he's this great runner and it's, you know, his girlfriend who I'm sure is going to go on to have some, uh, you know, glamorous life in a big city. She's always thinking, well, you know, you've got a talent and I don't, and you can be great at one thing, but I have to be just, just good at a, good at a few things. And so I think she's kind of envious of him, uh, uh, that way. And, um, and, you know, I just, I wanted to, you know, write about the working class without any politics, you know, getting involved because just people, people just seem to want to write about the working class and Trump. And this was, this was long before that. Yeah. It's the, so to you, I mean, you we touched on this briefly before, but is the working class really just the white working class? And well, no, where do, where no, do people, no, where do people a, of color fit in? That, yeah, not, mean, right? not, not at all. I mean, yeah, I always say that, you know, the working class isn't just a laid off steel worker in Ohio, you know, it's a, it's a black home healthcare aid in Chicago and a Latina chambermaid in, in, in San Diego. But I mean, I, I, I wrote about the white working class cause I'm white. I wouldn't describe yeah. myself as, as working class. You know, my dad worked, worked in an office, but you know, I, I, I would describe Lansing as a blue collar town. I mean, I went to high, my high school right across the street from, from an auto plant. So I was, I was brought up in that, in that environment. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I I just wanted to, to, you know, write about the values that I thought, you know, separated him from, as I said, you know, I guess the, the professional class, which is, you know, more, more of a devotion to hometown and, and family over, you know, individual achievement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's my dog. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, all right. Let, let's shift gears. I think the dog is telling me to shift gears. And uh, let, let's, I want to ask you a few questions about, uh, about writing, about your writing process, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so this is your first novel after, yeah. after many nonfiction books. Uh, why the switch to fiction now? Well, I actually wrote a couple other novels before I ever published a nonfiction book, but they just, you know, they weren't good enough. So, uh, this one, I wrote it on, uh, you know, one of those, they're like those school notebooks with the black covers. You know what I'm talking about with this, the hard black covers? Yeah. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote it on that. And, and it just, I guess because I was writing so much from my own experience, uh, it just seemed to come easily. It just seemed like I was just, you know, filling in words that were already there. It, it, it was not so much effort uh to write it i guess i mean i had to sit down and do it but it just felt like it was already there and i was filling in the blanks it's interesting a lot of, a lot of people say something similar to that for sure yeah i guess that's not what that's how you know it's working yeah did you feel like you were you, did you feel like you were working harder with your on your uh, unpublished novels i mean did you feel like yeah know, it was a harder grind maybe it was a harder grind maybe it just felt more artificial you know i was trying too hard or something like that yeah i mean i had a i had a novelist in talking one of these who had written i don't know she she's a breast cancer survivor her name's lynn cahoon Uh uh-huh she had her struggle with cancer and then she started writing romance novels and she cr- she's cranked out like 50 or something in 11 wow. years. Something well, there, there, like I mean, there's just like a formula and, for those. I, and, I don't... Yeah, well, what, but what she said, but she had an interesting piece of uh, writing advice. She said uh, she knows it's good if it, if it comes out fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, <laughs> you know, if it, feel, if it feels natural and it flows fast, the, the better it is, I guess. Right, right. Um, so... I, I wondered if you could talk about uh, whether you find it easier to write fiction or nonfiction, and uh, and what the what how the publishing process is different. I mean, you well, I guess I find answered it, a little bit of that already. Yeah, I guess I find it easier to write nonfiction because I've done so much of it, and the stories are already there. You know, I mean, I just through this one, I kind of kind of I don't know 
there was a little bit of feeling, feeling about being on a tightrope and wanting to make sure, you know, I, I kept it going and didn't, didn't make a wrong turn somewhere, and, you know, stayed on the, stayed on the straight and narrow with the story. Uh, this one, you know, I showed it to my agent and he didn't think it had much commercial potential. I'm not, maybe he was right. I mean, it doesn't seem to be selling that well. Uh, and uh, so then I just looked up, I think I just looked up blue collar fiction or something like that. And I found Bottom Dog Press in Huron, Ohio. And so I, I sent it to them. And within a week, they had accepted it for publication. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and this was in January and they published it in April. You know, they do they do print on demand. Um, and then this cover is uh, this guy actually he ran at Duke and I put it up on Facebook and a guy I had gone to college with. Um, he, he recognized him because uh, he taught him in high school. And so I got in oh, touch Oh, he knew with him. the picture? <laughs> yeah. So his name is Alex Miley. Um, and what is it? Of, is it just like, it's like sold as a stock photo? Yeah, now? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Huh. He's, and he's originally from Minnesota. <laughs> so, you know, so we got we got in touch. And he, was, he seemed really proud to oh, be Oh, well, that's the, great. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah that's that's interesting though so so did the so the book never uh your agent never submitted it to to the big six or whatever i mean um no that's too yeah bad. you know I, I i i think he was gonna but but then i just decided i'll i'll deal with it my i'll deal with it myself um so i'm just trying to get some uh you know i it's it's been hard to get some uh, attention for it. it's gotten a few regional uh reviews but uh you know that's that's it yeah i don't know you gotta i, I think people do the like 99 cents on kindle and try you know i don't know but. yeah you can buy it actually if you buy it on kindle i think i get more money than if you buy a, a hard copy but oh, i can yeah. sign a hard copy yeah yeah well i, I read the kindle book Kindle books nice and clean too, so everyone go out and buy the Kindle book. <laughs> I mean, it's a good. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and there were some typos in the first edition, but it was easy to. We, we I guess yeah. we got them all fixed. I hope you didn't see it, any or any or too many. Oh no, yeah, I could, I could have marked them for you had I known. <laughs> um. So how? Oh, how's the, okay. Well. Uh, so how's the uh, how's the there, there's not that many there's maybe like six in the whole book, but I, I noticed things like that. So <laughs> um, yeah, how's yeah I, I I don't know I went I went over it a few times and uh, you know send send him send him uh, the corrections and since it's print on demand you, it's pretty easy to fix. Yeah, you can just fix it as you go, kind of thing. Um, so exactly kind of so exactly isn't, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's different from, you know, I, I worked for a big six publisher and they had, a, you know, they assigned me a publicist and sent me on a book tour. And, you know, this is, this is just a, a small press in Ohio that specializes in blue collar fiction. So there hasn't been anything, anything like that. Yeah. Are you free? You're freezing up here. Oh yeah. I, I think, oh, there you go. I think you're freezing up. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. Well, maybe. We but anyway, it's my first. It's my first novel. I have, I have ideas for, for I have ideas for another one. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll work with a bigger publisher next time. Yeah. But cool. I mean, it seemed like the perfect fit, and it turned out it was. Yeah, well, I'm the glad you. I'm glad you published publisher, a book with the, the publisher. The guy who published it, he was a runner too. Oh, all right. right. Well, cool. see that that gets me into the Willoughby Library. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I want to ask you a few more questions about books, and then we'll and then we'll call it quits here because my okay. my kids are starting to crawl all over me. <laughs> so, okay. Um. So okay. What, all right. What are your, I understand. What are your favorite novels about running? Uh, I don't think I've ever read one. That's why I wrote really? one. There's one, <laughs> about, I've heard one, movies? it's called, uh, uh, well, let's see, movies. Um, yeah, there are some of the good ones. Uh, Running Brave with Robbie Benson, that's about Billy Mills. Um, and uh, 
without limits. That's probably my favorite. That's about uh, Steve uh, Prefontaine, who, who I mentioned in there. He was the runner who died in, in an automobile yeah. accident. Um, to me, you know, Chariots of Fire is about sprinters, so I couldn't, I couldn't relate to it uh, quite, quite as much. So yeah, I'd say those are my two favorite running movies. Were, were you a fan of, like, as a kid, were you a fan of the uh, nonfiction running, you know, running biographies and stuff Oh, like yeah, that? for like, sure. You know, know, yeah, there was a um, guy named Kenny Moore. He was an Olympic marathoner. He went on to write for Sports Illustrated. He wrote a book full of uh, profiles of runners. And um, uh, not too long ago, even, I got an autograph, uh, autobiography um, by Bill Rogers, um, who, you know, won the four Boston marathons and four New York marathons. So I used to subscribe to runner's world and, um, you know, would re read the running books you know, about all the, all the, all the great runners. And I mean, I was never that fast, but, uh, you know, Bill Rogers was one of my heroes, Frank Shorter, Alberto Salazar. They were, they were the big Americans were the big marathon guys when I was, when I was growing up and now it's all Kenyans. Yeah. Um, so what about, what about other novels about the auto industry? I'm just curious if there's other fiction books. Uh, about the line of the... well, I mean, there's nonfiction books. There's a book called Rivet Head by Ben Hamper, which I really like a lot. And I've gotten to meet Ben. Uh, he, it's a, a memoir and it's just really, really funny. Uh, it's, you know, it's a memoir of, uh, the 11 years he worked for GM and Flint and he, he, got his start he was writing for the flint voice which became the michigan voice which was the newspaper that that michael moore edited and he started out writing music reviews which was his passion and michael moore convinced him to write a column uh about the shop uh, and uh, i mean he just had a fantastic voice he's never written another book i just I don't think mm -hmm. he writes it all anymore. he lives up near traverse city now and he does a does a you know dj's a radio show and works at a bar and uh, he had that. He had one one book in him, but it was a fantastic book. Huh. Great. Yeah. Thanks for the recommendation there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Oh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you what's coming up next for you. Oh um, uh, well, I, I have I, another I, nonfiction in the works, or yeah, are you publishing you know, something like next month. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I I, I uh, have a proposal out there, and I'm told that there's possibly a publisher interested about uh, Abraham Lincoln and, and Stephen, Stephen Douglas and about how they set aside their rivalry uh, to, uh, under the threat of secession in the Civil War and, and huh. work together. So the, the, the Midnight, in, Midnight in Vehicle City was my Michigan history book and this would be my Illinois history book. You know, the, the two states yeah. that have been most most important in my life if you were to write an ohio history book what what incident would you write about well you know i I've, I've thought about doing you know i do a lot of these uh library talks obviously have a lot of people in and i think that uh a book on uh 10 cent beer night would do would oh yeah really well <laughs> well i think there you know you could you could work some of these same themes in there you know I think there was just a book on disco demolition night at, at Comiskey Park. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the same. That was the same thing. Yeah, I because I, I I was I was thinking I had someone. I mean, I've I've done all the talks, you know, especially all the right. local. Right. I had someone come in and give a talk about uh, Bertman's ballpark mustard, which is uh -huh. like, you know, it has to do with Cleveland Stadium and. Oh, okay. and for some reason, it got me thinking, or, or we were talking about Ten Cent Beer Night or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, I wonder if there's a book about that, and there's no book about it. And okay. you know, it, would, it would do it would do really well with that. Uh, you know, I don't know, 180, 200 page, nice and light treatment. Right. And probably, probably right now, you know, there's still some of the people alive, but uh -huh. probably starting to die. You know, probably be a good uh, good time to write it. So right right i don't know but uh well i how do you do it with two young kids that's that's a question for yeah you. yeah and I, uh, I did it <laughs> and uh 
here's a, here's another here's something I'm interested in since we're doing this you know we have a lot of aspiring writers uh, uh-huh. listening tonight and and uh, we're doing this workshop with Literary Cleveland that's part of this little series uh-huh. here. Don't do it. Um, don't so, don't so do it something... unless you can't help it. <laughs> yeah. Don't think you're yeah, going to make well, money. Don't I, think you're going to make money. Is, yeah. You, you, I mean, you have two books out this year. Yeah. Uh, is it is it possible to make a living as a writer? And uh, and not, what else not, do you do for money? <laughs> not well. Not just by writing. Not just by writing books. You know, I'd write articles too, and I to give these talks. Uh, you know, you're just going to have to piece it together. But you know, unless unless. Yeah, unless you're grinding out these genre fiction novels, I think those are really the only authors who are just making a, if, a living. Just yeah, if you just can if you can grind them books. Out, then. Yeah, yeah. I, I had an idea though for uh, I thought something about the 1920 Indians uh, might be might make a good book because you know that they won in the wake of the Black Sox scandal and that was the that was the last year before the Yankees took over baseball oh it was, yeah it was sort of the the end of <laughs> the old dead ball era yeah I, I i just had someone uh come in and give a talk about the 1948 indians oh right yeah the, the la- last indians team to win the world series and uh it, it dealt with uh you know integration right and i was, was in great I, great book i was in boston a while ago and i visited the site where they won that world series uh, oh really the grandstand of the brave stadium is now a uh, part of a, an athletic facility at boston university wow yeah right very kind of, interesting right along the trails and there's a plaque uh i think about the 1940 because that's where the 1948 world series was played and that's where the last game took place yeah huh wow that's, that's had no idea and that's very yeah. cool yeah um all right, last last question, I think. Okay. Um, I'm going to start asking people this because, but so if, if you could have dinner with one writer, dead or alive, who would it be, and what would you say? Uh, see, um, <laughs> it would have to be a successful writer, so he would pick up the check. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I you know. Uh, I'd say my favorite novelists are John Steinbeck and uh, Willa Cather, but I, I think I would probably rather have dinner uh, with with John Steinbeck because I think he he was uh, he was more into the gustatory pleasures. Uh, you know, I just re- I actually just finished rereading Travels with Charlie. You know, and he, he was practically traveling with a portable bar. Uh, in his in his vehicle, you know he. You know, and... I, I saw I saw a picture of Steinbeck a few years ago that really yeah. changed my opinion of him. I, I just and I I can't really remember what the uh, what the picture was exactly, but he just looked way more gruff and mean really? and rough than I than I thought he was, and I I just huh. think that I it think was... that he's a pretty I think that he was a pretty you know salt of the earth and uh, right and right rough and tumble individual i don't know but it'd be, yeah, I mean, it'd be very that'd be a very good it'd be a very interesting dinner for sure. yeah yeah but i've been rereading a lots of books that i enjoyed when i was young and i'm, I'm going through all of steinbeck is is one of them uh and i didn't really i, I didn't really like the grapes of wrath again i just thought that was kind of agitprop but i think i think of mice and men is about as perfect a book as i've ever read it's a great book. I, yeah. I, I, as a kid, I mean, I loved East of Eden. I just, I yeah, just I, that's, that's, I'm going to reread that soon. And I reread Cannery Row and Cannery Row is a book that's really been an inspiration for me. And even in Dubious Battle, I think that would, that was a strike book. And I think that probably inspired a lot of what I wrote. It when probably I, did. Yeah. When, yeah. when I did, um, uh, when I did, uh, uh, Midnight Vehicle City, I was kind of trying to make it a cross between, you know, proletarian literature and noir literature, which were two genres that were both big in the 1930s when the, when the story took place. And, and you know, yeah. Steinbeck was one of the one of the leading lights of the proletarian uh, literature movement. And I just started reading a book about the WPA guides because the University of Michigan hired me to work on a project. It's just going to be like an updated WPA guide to Michigan. And they want me to write about the auto industry. 
Huh, cool. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, <laughs> here. Hey, Lyle, come here. My my kid is, uh, oh, is keeps bumping the table. He's, he's as blonde so if as I'm distracted. That's why <laughs> he's as he's as blonde as mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His luckily, is, luckily, is, none is, of them look anything like me. <laughs> oh, his name is Lyle. Yeah, Lyle. Yeah. Oh, okay, mine is named Birch, like the tree. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah gotta gotta come up with cool <laughs> names. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I got Lark, Birch, and Rose. Those are. Oh. Great. three three nature names <laughs> cool yeah I, I was i was thinking about uh, <laughs> i was thinking about uh, uh some I, I can't i can't think about it now but i was thinking about a name that means of the trees but now i now i can't remember oh elwood elwood, elwood. Means elwood. Of the, of the, oh yeah of that the may, forest or something that makes sense okay. but of course elwood uh my wife convinced me that that right. just has a from Chicago. You would know first thing right. you think of blues. Elwood, yeah. Elwood blues, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that about does it. All right, let me just hold up the book one more time. So, yeah, if you like a signed copy, you can email me at tedmcclellan at gmail dot com. Uh, great to be great to be back in, and I'm, I've run out of books that I can that I can talk to you about. So I have to write some more. Yeah, sounds good. We'll catch you for the next one. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, Ted. You have, too, have Travis. You too. Have a good night, everyone.